For professional footballers, whilst playing football might still be a passion for them and a labour of love, it is also their job. When most people are offered more money to do the same job for another employer, they will say yes. Why do you think that I first took a job as a writer at HITC? I could hardly take issue with someone like Keen Lewis Potter for leaving my club Hull City then, in order to play Premier League football and earn Premier League wages at Brentford, or Mikhailo Mudrick for swapping a £5,000 a week salary at Shakhtar Donetsk for almost £100,000 a week at Chelsea. It's for that reason that I am often inclined to defend footballers when they're accused of being uniquely greedy or concerned with finances. The likes of Wayne Rooney, Raheem Sterling and Marcus Rashford frequently either had or still have their high salaries weaponised against them by the English press, despite paying almost 50% tax on their income, whereas the same people and publications are conspicuously quiet when it comes to someone like Hugh Grosvenor, the Duke of Westminster, receiving an £8.3 billion inheritance without paying a single penny in tax. It's almost like classism is deeply entrenched in English society. Oh well. Nonetheless, there are still some instances where even my charity towards footballers is tested to the very limit. Mateus Pereira, for example, had the pick of a couple of Premier League teams, including West Ham, following an excellent season in which he was relegated at West Brom, but he chose to join Al-Hilal in Saudi Arabia instead. In a statement posted on Twitter, Pereira justified his decision by claiming that it would <clears throat> secure his family's future and help him realise his goal of financial independence. It's refreshingly candid and honest in some respects that Pereira essentially just came out and said that money was his only motivator, but, and call me crazy for this one, whilst wanting to secure your family's future is a noble aim, I don't think anyone would disagree with that, with the right budgeting, effective use of coupons, and by not investing all of your money in an obscure cryptocurrency, I reckon it's possible to secure your family's future and reach financial independence on a salary of £4 million a year at West Ham. Pereira is now seeking an exit from Saudi Arabia and has gone on loan to the United Arab Emirates, reportedly in a dispute with Al-Hilal over unpaid wages. Or how about Dutch forward Pierre van Hooydonk, who left title-chasing Celtic to join relegation threat in Nottingham Forest in March 1997, after being offered a deal worth £364,000 a year at Celtic Park. Van Hooydonk stated that £7,000 a week, quote, might be good enough for the homeless, but not for an international striker. He later went on strike at Forest when the Premier League club refused to put him on the transfer market. It is those more obscene and borderline offensive instances of greed consistently illustrated throughout a player's career that we are interested in with this seven. It's not enough, like Nicholas and Elka, simply to have bounced around between a series of clubs and made a few transfers concerned almost solely with cash. I want players like Marcus the Bag Chaser Bag, who gave up a second shot at making it in a top five European league in order to play in Greece, Abu Dhabi and Russia, or Oberfemi Martins, who would have played on Mars if the terms had been right, and who moved to Wuhan for that reason at what you'd have to say was the worst possible time. Hopefully that all makes sense then, and without further ado, following a heck of a long intro even by my standards, here are seven footballers who, at almost every turn, seem to prioritise money above all else. Seventh, Stefan Mbia. Anyone who joined Queen's Park Rangers between the years 2011 and 2013 only had one thing on their minds. That goes for Jose Bossingua, Jermaine Genus, and Christopher Samba, all players who probably could have made this seven, and it certainly goes for Stefan Mbia. A talented and intelligent defence midfielder who could also deputise at centre-back or in central midfield, Ambia was born and raised in Cameroon before moving to France at the age of 18 when he was signed by Rennes. 
That was followed by a move to Marseille in 2009 for more than £10 million, where he won four trophies including a league and title, before a financial crisis forced the French giants into a fire sale in 2012. Umbia had several offers, including from other Premier League clubs, but he chose to join QPR, as he puts it because he wanted to test himself in London. Well, that he certainly did. QPR were relegated during his only season playing in London, finishing rock bottom of the Premier League. And Bia wasn't about to stick around and play championship football, oh no. Joining Sevilla on loan and then on a permanent, and pretty soon, he was on the move once again, this time joining free spending traps on Spore, along with the likes of Jose Bossingua and Oscar Cardozo. Six months later, Ambia was offered an even bigger bag of cash to star in the Chinese Super League, the hottest destination at that time for any self-respecting mercenary, so he signed on the dotted line for Herbei China Fortune. By 2018, his stock looked to have fallen somewhat as he returned to France to sign for Toulouse, but literally six months later, he jumped at the chance to return to China, this time with Wuhan, where he had two stints, either side of a brief spell, at Shanghai Shenhua. Say what you want about Stefan and Beer, but he is a man who has never knowingly turned down a fat wad of cash, regardless of who was offering it, what league they played in, or what it would mean for his future career prospects. Sixth, Axel Witzel. There are a fair few footballers that I see being somewhat harshly labelled as greedy all the time, while someone like Axel Witzel tends to get off scot-free. Well, not anymore. I'm here to tell you that the Belgian midfield anchor has a level of greed which wouldn't look out of place on the board of one of Britain's privatised water companies. Albeit, he does pour considerably less raw sewage into Britain's rivers and oceans, at least as far as we know. I am being unforgiving with Witzel, because he is someone who is so immensely talented, as one of the outstanding players in Belgium's star-studded golden generation, yet he chose to spend his very best years playing in Russia and China, so he could earn a boatload of cash, before trying to salvage a career at the highest level, only once he was already on the verge of turning 30 years old. Back in 2012, a 23-year-old Witzel had the world at his feet, sought after by virtually every super club in Europe following a single season at Benfica, including Manchester United and Real Madrid. He chose to join Zenit St. Petersburg for €40 million Euros instead, not because of the city's beautiful architecture, but because of the insane salary he was offered which actually prompted some Zenit players to voice concerns about wage disparity within the Zenit squad. They were subsequently demoted to the team's reserves. After four and a half seasons at Zenit, age 27, Witzel once again had lots of choice when it came to his next destination in January 2017. Sought after by Everton, Chelsea and Juventus, the latter two of whom became their domestic champions that season, Witzel turned his nose up at all of them, deciding, once again, to follow the money, signing a contract said to be worth 18 million euros a year with Tianjin Quanjian in the Chinese Super League, a club, incidentally, that no longer exists. Witzel said of his decision to reject Juve and Chelsea in favour of Tianjin, and I quote, it was a very difficult decision because... On one hand, there was a great team in a top club like Juventus, but on the other, there was a crucial offer for my family that I couldn't turn down. These footballers, eh? They just bloody love their families so bloody much. Witzel has been back in Europe since 2018, though only because the Chinese Super League collapsed, and following four years at Borussia Dortmund, he joined Atletico Madrid in 2022, where he earns almost a third of his reported wage in China, and about the same as he did over a decade ago when he first signed for Zenit. Fifth, Asamoah Jan. Outside of Ghana, Asamoah Jan is best known for two things, the first being his starring role but penalty miss against Uruguay at the 2010 World Cup, and the second being his relentless pursuit of Moolah 
above all else. In Ghana, Jeanne is actually quite a divisive figure, as I only recently discovered, and he describes himself as being both the most loved and the most hated footballer in Ghana, despite breaking into the national team at the age of 17 and going on to score 51 goals from 109 caps, making him Ghana's all-time leading goalscorer. I think Jean was a very capable forward, otherwise he wouldn't have made my seven, yet he never registered a single appearance in any UEFA competition. Signed by Udinese as an 18-year-old, Jean joined Rennes in 2008 before earning a move to the Premier League with Sunderland following his 2010 World Cup exploits. Jean impressed during his debut campaign, hitting double figures along with Darren Bent as Sunderland finished 10th, so there was some surprise at the start of the following season when it was announced that he would be leaving Sunderland in order to join Alain. There was a little bit less shock, admittedly, after it was revealed that the UAE Pro League side, based in Abu Dhabi, had offered Jan $250,000 a week. When quizzed about the move, Jan told 442, quote, Look, I'm going to be honest here, it was the money. End quote. You don't say, Asamoah. After four seasons playing in the desert, where he scored 123 goals in 123 games, Jeanne, still aged only 29 at the time, had a big decision to make. Try and test himself at the very highest level, or see if he could earn enough money to build his own space project. He chose the latter, signing a contract with Chinese Super League side Shanghai SIPG, reported to be worth $350,000 a week which made Jan one of the highest paid players on the planet in 2015. Jan was significantly less prolific in China, earning approximately £3 million for every goal that he scored, and his next moves were back to the UAE, this time to Dubai, Turkey, and then the lucrative Indian Super League. I joked about Jan developing his own space program a moment ago, but he did actually launch his own airline in 2017, called Baby Jet Airlines, which, somewhat ironically, never actually got off the ground. He also owns his own music group, restaurant chain, boxing promotion brand, tennis tournament, and logistics business, among many others, and he has denied reports recently that he has lost the enormous fortune that he amassed whilst playing in China and the Middle East. Fourth, Alex Song. Alex Song didn't jump ship in as egregious or obviously money-orientated moves quite as often as Asamoah Jan, but he was so brazen and open about money, essentially being the only thing on his mind, that I almost feel as though he would take issue with me if I didn't include him in this seven. Born in Cameroon, Song's father died when he was only three years old, so he was raised by his uncle and Cameroon's all-time record appearance holder, Rigobert Song. At 16 years old, Song joined Bastia on the island of Corsica, and almost immediately began representing France at under-16 level. After breaking into the Bastia first team, though, he decided to represent Cameroon instead. There was interest in a teenage Song from virtually every major club in Europe, including Juventus and Manchester United, but he joined Arsenal loan in 2005, and then on a permanent basis in 2006. Song wasn't an instant success at the Emirates, initially actually going out on loan, but by the age of 21 he was a regular fixture in Arsene Wenger's first team, and he really came into his element once Robin Van Persie was flying from about 2010 onwards, and the two of them struck up a real rapport. Whilst he was playing well, Song wasn't satisfied, claiming that he couldn't even save £100,000 during his six years at Arsenal, despite signing an initial contract with the club, which was worth £15,000 a week, that is, almost £800,000 a year, and his last contract in North London being worth £55,000 a week, which is close to £3 million a year. When Barcelona offered to bump Song's salary up to £70,000 a week, he didn't think twice, later commenting, quote, I met Barca's sporting director, and he told me I would not get to play many games. But I didn't give a f I knew that now, I would become a millionaire. 
I wanted to rub shoulders with the big boys. I could shop wherever I wanted and have crazy nights out. End quote. Song returned to the Premier League with West Ham on loan in 2014, before signing a lucrative deal to join Ruben Kazan in the Russian Premier League. In 2018, Song joined FC Sion in Switzerland, where his contract was terminated after he refused to take a pay cut during the pandemic, and since November 2020, Song, now aged 35, has been contracted to AS Arta Solar 7, a free spending and rather suspect football club in Djibouti, with a questionable owner that I have made an entire documentary about, should any of you be interested. Song, presumably, made the move to Djibouti due to his belief in Arta Solar's project. Third, Taliska. Lots of players sacrifice other considerations in favour of cash throughout their careers, but it is the ones who are so talented that they could have had it all, while still becoming unfathomably rich, that frustrate me the most, and occupy most of the inclusions in this seven. Anderson Taliska, born Anderson Souza Conceição, and better known simply as Taliska, is a prime example of that. Such a well-rounded attacking midfielder, when he made his name with Bahia and at Benfica, Taliska is 6 foot 3 inches tall, intelligent, he's a brilliant athlete, he's superb with the ball at his feet, and he can both score and create goals at will. I don't think that he was quite capable of reaching the level of Rivaldo, very few players ever have, but there was definitely a touch of the former Barcelona legend about him, and I think that he very easily could have racked up, let's say, half a century of caps for a Brazil team that hasn't reached a World Cup final in more than 20 years. In 2016, though, Taliska joined Besiktas on a two-year loan deal, a surprising move given the high regard that he was held in and the level of interest in him. After starring in Turkey for two seasons, Taliska was sought after by the likes of Roma, Wolves, Liverpool and Manchester United, and he expressed a desire, publicly at least, to play in the Premier League. Once again, Taliska took the road that was paved in gold though, joining Guangzhou Evergrande of the Chinese Super League on a six-month loan deal, followed by a permanent move, penning a deal that was reported as being worth a minimum of 7.5 million euros a year. As the Chinese Super League crumbled, in a demise that I also just covered in another documentary, Taliska, who is still only 28 years old, joined Al Nazir in the Saudi Pro League on a deal which is said to be worth a little over £100,000 a week. Taliska almost certainly could have received the same salary from a club in Europe, but Saudi Arabia has no income tax, effectively doubling his take-home pay. With that being said, it still feels like a massive waste of his talent, and I still think that he is by far the best player at Al Nazir, given his age, even following Ronaldo's arrival, who earns considerably more than him. The fact that he will almost certainly retire without having won a single cap for Brazil is a reflection of the decisions that Taliska has made. Second, Adrian Mirzejewski. I put up a question on Twitter asking people to send in their own suggestions before I made this seven, and one thing that I didn't expect was the disproportionately high frequency of Polish players that cropped up. One suggestion that I borrowed, and an excellent one at that I thought, was for Adrian Merzajewski, which came courtesy of Dar, aka Scallion1. Less well known than everyone else that has featured up to this point, Merzajewski spent the first nine years of his career playing domestic football in Poland before seemingly coming to the realisation that he could earn a lot, lot more money playing elsewhere. In 2011, he joined Turkish Super League side Trabzonspor for 5.25 million euros, which was a record fee for the extra classa at that time. Following three seasons playing in Turkey, during which time he was a regular fixture for Poland, Merzajewski joined our old friends Al Nazir in Saudi Arabia, who are like a mecca for the world's greediest footballers, incidentally based in the same country as the actual city of Mecca. He then joined Al Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, 
Sydney FC in the A-League, and Chongchun Yatai, Chongqing Lifan, Guangzhou R&F, and Shanghai Shenhua in the Chinese Super League. It should be said, Merzhaevsky was excellent in both Saudi Arabia and Australia, though that only reiterated what a loss he was to high-level football. Merzhaevsky's move to Saudi Arabia also marked the end of his involvement with Poland's national team, and I'm not sure I've seen too many players who have won as many caps as him over such a short international career, given that he won his first cap in 2010 and his last in 2013, yet he made 41 international appearances during that time. Merzhaevsky, age 35, is now one of only a few Europeans still left in the Chinese Super League, having joined Henan Shongshan Longmen in 2022. First, Hulk. Not to be confused with The Hulk, the American comic book superhero, whose strength tends to be proportionate to his level of anger, the Brazilian footballer Hulk is renowned instead for signing massive contracts in obscure leagues and proceeding to bully defenders who are massively inferior to him. Hulk's goal-scoring record, for someone who has spent most of his career playing out wide, albeit he is now an out-and-out centre-forward, is absolutely absurd. In 691 games, he has scored 372 goals, and it is for that reason, combined with his explosive speed, strength, and skill, the Hulk has frequently been sought after by some of the world's biggest football clubs. He has turned them all down, time and time again, in favour of signing for much smaller clubs who have offered him much larger contracts. Hulk made his name playing in Japan before signing for Porto in 2008. It was during his time in Portugal, where Hulk scored 77 goals in 170 games from the right flank and starred repeatedly in the Champions League, that he caught the attention of Manchester United and reigning European champions Chelsea in 2012. According to Hulk himself, he was only made aware of Chelsea's interest in him after signing the biggest contract in the entire history of the Russian Premier League with Zenit St. Petersburg. Though, that would seem to be a little at odds with the article that I found of him discussing Chelsea's interest in him with 442 Magazine in June of 2012. I know, I've got him absolutely banged to rights on that one. Zenit paid 60 million euros to sign Hulk, handing him a contract which was reportedly worth $8 million a season, or a little over $150,000 a week. Following four seasons playing in Russia, where Hulk scored 77 goals once again, but this time in only 148 games, he yet again passed up the opportunity to really test himself against the best in the business, signing an incredible £320,000 a week deal with Shanghai SIPG in the Chinese Super League instead. After he had earned almost $100 million playing in China, once the proverbial hit the fan and a wage cap was introduced, Hulk announced that, funnily enough, he wouldn't be signing a new deal in Shanghai and that he wanted to return to Europe and play in the Champions League. Despite claiming that he had several offers, Hulk actually ended up signing for Atletico Mineiro two years ago, where he has since scored 67 goals in 115 games and is the division's third highest earner. So those are seven of the biggest mercenaries in world football, solely focused on players, otherwise Sven would have waltzed straight in. A special mention goes to the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi and David Beckham, probably the three highest paid footballers of all time, who have all signed grubby deals to sportswash despotic authoritarian theocratic dictatorships in the forms of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which is worse than anything that the seven who featured have done. In truth, I'm not chastising anyone in this seven, albeit I do think it's a shame that we never got to see what the likes of Taliska or Hulk could have done at the very highest level, but I was just intrigued to see which players have most routinely sacrificed all else in favour of stockpiling as much cash as was humanly possible. My shortlist was a pretty lengthy one, so if this video gets a stupid number of views, I would be willing to make a rare part two. 
Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram just by the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. I'd highly recommend it.